This week on the Back Table Podcast. Sometimes police can be interrupting care. One person's trying to put an IV in or doing an assessment while the police officer is there asking questions, and that can be distracting for everybody. On the other side of that, you have the risk and benefit that you're weighing of, you know, not pissing off the guy with the, with the gun in his hand and being arrested yourself. Now, some people don't, don't worry about that. And it's nice to live in the privilege of having, not having that fear, but just knowing that that's a possibility for me is, is frightening. There have been doctors and nurses that have been threatened to be arrested for not doing blood draws or not doing cavity searches. So there's personal risk of possibly being arrested. So you have to balance it, your own sanity and safety versus standing up for your patient. And that, that can be hard. That's not intuitive. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Back Table Podcast. My name is Vishal Kumar, and I will be your guest host this week. I want to thank Aaron Fritz and the rest of the Back Table Podcast team for allowing us to use this platform to center the conversation around health equity. While the views expressed during these conversations are mine and mine alone, I take comfort in knowing I am supported by an institution and community that is committed to transformative justice and addressing health inequities. If you think like me, and I know that I do, I believe interventional radiology is the most incredible specialty in medicine today. Having the privilege of taking care of patients who need help and need access to level one trauma center services is not something I take lightly. According to a 2006 analysis in the New England Journal, authored by McKinsey et al., in which the authors looked at the effects of trauma center care on mortality throughout this country, they showed that treatment of severely injured persons at a level one trauma center compared to a non-trauma center was associated with a 25% reduction in mortality. San Francisco General Hospital, which is a level one trauma center, and Safety Net Hospital for more than 1.5 million residents of the San Francisco and northern San Mateo counties sees close to 4,000 trauma cases annually. If we do our jobs right, we have the opportunity to give members of our community, our city, a better chance for survival. That means working hand-in-hand with our ED physicians, trauma surgeons to help take care of critically ill patients. Sometimes that means embolizing patients who are bleeding to death, with anesthesia, massive transfusion protocols as part of the critical care equation. Seeing a life-threatening bleed in real time on angiography is nothing short of precision-based medicine. And the ability to embolize it through a catheter that measures less than one millimeter in diameter is nothing short of magic. But if I stop and start to take a look outside the IR suites, I start to see people who I'm not always used to seeing in our control rooms. And the more I look, the more I start to appreciate the presence of police in operating rooms, emergency departments, patient care areas, hallways, cafeterias, and at the hospital entrances. Back to the listeners, just a friendly reminder as we get into the mid-year, we now have the option for you to obtain CME by filling out a reflection after listening. Powered by CMEFI, a seamless way for busy clinician learners to discover internet point-of-care learning opportunities that reward CME credits and more. Find the link in the show notes or under the episode at backtable.com. Today's topic is the presence of police within spaces of healing, and specifically the presence of police within the emergency department. To help me engage in today's conversation is Dr. Jamal Jefferson. Dr. Jefferson is a PGY3 emergency resident at Highland Hospital, the largest safety net hospital in the East Bay area of Northern California. He completed his undergraduate degree at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, and his medical degree at the University of Rochester School of Medicine, while also obtaining his master's in business administration at the Simon School of Business at the University of Rochester. Prior to his residency, Dr. Jefferson played wide receiver at Williams College, taught at Match Public Charter School in Boston, Massachusetts, and worked in the Bonham Lab at the NIH, researching the effects of altitude changes on individuals with sickle cell trait. Dr. Jefferson's academic interests include point-of-care ultrasound, pain management, and cardiology. 
His personal interests include golf, exploring new trails, indoor cycling, and traveling with his partner. Dr. Jefferson, on behalf of all of Interventional Radiology, welcome to the podcast and thank you for your service during this global pandemic. Well, Shaw, thank you for that uh, generous uh, introduction. And, uh, you know, it's my pleasure to go to work every single day. So uh, thank you for all that you do as well. We're in this together. Well, I appreciate it, Jamal. Before we begin to tackle the enormity of police presence and institutions of healing, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners about yourself? Man, I, I really think that you covered everything. Um, you know, I always like to start off with uh, identifiers, much like in medicine. Uh, you always have that one-liner in, in medicine. And uh, so I myself uh, identify as a cisgender, heterosexual, black male. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, and I, I, I personally think that's a it's good to set the stage to give context and to recognize that everybody has a different perspective in which they, they speak on and different lived experiences, which are unique. So I just wanted to add that in there. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to do that. Well, thank you for the uh, reminder and opportunity. Let me also identify uh, myself. Um, I identify as a cisgender heterosexual male with Asian Indian immigrant uh, identity uh, who happens to hold U.S. citizenship. Thank you for the reminder. Both of us share common ground as healthcare providers at safety net hospitals. We recognize that between 1990 and 2010, approximately 200 hospitals closed across America's largest cities, including almost 150 nonprofit hospitals. As someone who is a frontline healthcare provider at a safety net hospital in an incredibly diverse area within the California East Bay region, what role does the emergency department play for your patients? And I mean, it plays a huge role. You know, number one, African Americans, especially, um, use the emergency department uh, at very high levels, higher levels than most other uh, ethnic groups, races. And even when you control for socioeconomic status, that continues. That trend continues. You know, we are not only. Uh, a place where people get medical care, but, you know, people come there for different social reasons. There is a huge extension of emergency medicine called social emergency medicine in which, you know, people are getting access to things like Suboxone. People are getting access to uh, social work and services to, uh, and especially these days when people are, are coming in for, you know, COVID tests, just a simple COVID tests so they could get into shelters. These are, these are seem like very, they don't seem very important to, to a lot of people, but they're important services that at least, uh, the place where I work right now, we offer, and it's incredibly important that we, you know, create this trust with the community because we, we want people to come when they're in their, their most vulnerable moments and when they, they need something. And it's our job if we can't figure it out today, if we see, especially if we see huge trends of what the community needs, then the, the emergency department is a great place where you know, we can help and, and serve the community uh, in, in, in all the different capacities and be an extension into the community. You mentioned the critical nature of trust in building that relationship with patients who present in their most vulnerable, sometimes discombobulated states, whether it's due to illness, the effects of toxins or trauma. How, how is it that we in the healthcare system can actually be complicit in uh, further injustices to those patients? Yeah, I, I think that, um, I mean, I think we're going to get into it with, you know, having third parties of enter into the, the, the medical space. You know, if our, we take an oath to say do no harm when we enter into medical school. But, you know, I think sometimes we can we can be complicit and not understand some of the ramifications of some of our actions. Personally, I just think about uh, uh, the ramifications of putting someone on, so for example, putting someone on what's called a 5150, which is like a, a hold for either grave disability, a danger to self or danger to others. And the ramifications, the downstream effects that that has on someone else. And, you know, it's absolutely necessary to do that for most of the time, but 
I, I don't think when we were in, in the moment, uh, it's hard to think about those downstream effects and that it has for people when they enter into a courtroom to discuss custody of a child, for example. You know? I think when if we're talking about it a little bit later, but when police on are inside the emergency department, you know, are we compliant and being quote unquote good citizens by cooperating with police and uh, not protecting the patient's privacy and confidentiality? You know, these are these are just uh, these are issues that I think I deal with and think about every day. They're they're tough questions that I have to answer myself. I don't have all the answers to that, but you know, it, we're we're put in this position where we we have to make these decisions very very quickly. And I think it's important to have those conversations uh, about these issues because uh, they're they're daily issues that we we don't speak about every day, but we have to make decisions on every day. Before we dig into some of the details about how we as healthcare providers may be complicit in some of the injustices and criminalization of our patients who are seeking help, could you comment on the role of exposure as part of the workup in the emergency department when you're working with very limited information? Sure, yeah. So, as you know, Michelle, I mean, people come into the emergency department in very vulnerable uh, situations. Some, you know, some people are are with it. Some people are unconscious. Some people are strapped down to black to backboards. They can't they can't go anywhere. Uh, they're it's a very vulnerable situation. And while in medical codes or trauma codes, uh, some of uh, some of people might re- recognize like the strict algorithms of the A B C D E's airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and then the last part being exposure. And uh, I've been, you know, been thinking about exposure a lot um, as, you know, we started talking about this, think, putting this podcast together. And that exposure aspect is really important because you get to, you have to get, you get to look at every, like the person's whole body and to be able to see if there's any injuries anywhere, especially in, in, a, in a trauma situation, you want to make sure you're not missing anything. But I really think that um, in the most vulnerable moment of a person's life, that's when sometimes sometimes law and medicine collide. And there's this huge gray area in which, uh, again, this is something that we, we do every day, but we don't think about every day, how we can, we can perpetuate uh, criminalization of people in the emergency department if we're not careful uh, and how we deal with that E part of it. You know, you talk about criminalization of the patients. From the patient's perspective, from the, from the lived experience of a disenfranchised or marginalized patient, member of the community, coming into the hospital as a victim of trauma or illness, how is a patient supposed to feel in a place of healing when they are surrounded by a potentially threatening force like the police in the emergency department? Yeah, and this is where things get hard for everyone. You know, the uh, as you know, the 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 patient is in their most vulnerable moment. They have come into the emergency department because they're seeking help. We as as providers doctors, nurses, techs, we, at least we should be non-judgmental about how people get to this place. But sometimes, uh, you know, we, we have our biases and we have to recognize that sometimes we're not completely uh, impartial about the way we view people in this state. And then uh, we have, uh, depending on why the person is coming to the emergency department and they might be in police custody. They may not be, they may not they may be in t- under an investigation or there just might be police around. It doesn't necessarily have to be that person. Uh, ha- I have to be under any in custody, but sometimes just having police present uh, presence for, I don't know, a lot, a lot of black folks is kind of, uns- it's unsettling sometimes because you do not have, the privacy that you want in the emergency department. Curtains sometimes are open. Doors are sometimes open. People kind of freely move 
throughout the emergency department, especially if they get into the back. If we see some of our, our first responders back there, uh, for the most part, we allow them to, you know, to observe and, and that's, that's fine. Uh, but I do think that you get into some situations where you really have to be, you really have to be an active participant in protecting the patient's privacy. And sometimes that's not at the forefront of our minds. You know, according to a 2017 American Journal of Public Health publication, police brutality as a structural system has been identified to cause harm on a large scale, truly a systemic scale, meaning their sheer presence in spaces of healing may be compromising the healing process by introducing increases in poor mental health days, frequent mental health distress, and honestly just compromising the patient's ability to focus on healing, as you said. As we are agents of, agents of trust and allyship for the patients, when they see white coats standing side by side, police, whether in the CT scanners and the angio suites, the operating rooms or the emergency departments, how do you think that affects the patient's ability or willingness to engage in a trustworthy dialogue with us in those moments of vulnerability? Yeah, thanks, thanks for bringing that paper up. You know, I, at number one, I think it's it's amazing how much reading that you do on the subject, um, and how I personally am always educated when we have talks. You know, my 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 experience is both uh, lived and through literature, but uh, yours is uh, definitely uh, heavier on the literature, and you educate me. But to your question, I trust is a is a huge part of what I do. I mean. I meet strangers every single day. They don't. They don't know me uh, from Adam, as as my uh, mom used to used to say. Um, so it's very complicated because the first touch with the emergency with with the health system, either you think that is if it is or not, is with the with the police. If the for example, if they're bringing someone in, that could be their their first interaction, and people don't know. You know, what, what's your angle? What, what team you're on a lot of times? And you know, so I, I personally have to make it very, very clear to a lot of my, a lot of my patients, but especially my, uh, the African-American patients I see, because I know what type of historical and cultural relationship that the black community has had with the police is to say to first separate the, the, the officer uh, from the situation, get as much privacy as possible, um, as much as I can in, in an emergency department, and then try to, try to dispel all the information that they're going to tell me, try to dispel the, the, the idea that I am going to go back and tell them, and that this is a private conversation. Whatever, you, whatever it happened to get you here has nothing to do with the way I'm going to treat you as a patient. And I am super hyper aware of, of that. And I, because I, I, on the other side, I, I know I don't have, I don't, sometimes I don't think that other providers may be aware of that. And I know that there's some, like, for example, some nurses at where I'm wearing, uh, where I work, uh, wear like junior sh sheriff badges, and they may not know what kind of effect that has on the patient that they're taking care of, you know, regardless if the pa the person uh, is brought in because they're they're a suspect, we as as medical providers should be to trust to treat them with the utmost respect. And the the last thing I'll say is that whatever their experience is, is going to have a it's going to have a ripple effect through their community. So. If they go back and they say they had a terrible experience at the emergency department, then their friends are going to know, their family are going to know, and they're going to be more reluctant to come to the emergency department. Even if they're having, having an emergency, it might take them longer to get there, which might delay care for them, which, uh, which will increase uh, morbidity and mor mortality. So, I'll, you know, we're in the customer service business in some ways and, and the, the way I think about it. And we, we have to work to, to, to build those bridges because uh, that's, that's what we do.
Well, I thank you for the insight and the positive uh, compliment at the beginning. I, I only read in order to improve my own reality of the world. I feel like much of my education has fallen very short in trying to understand the ways in which oppression is affecting our patient outcomes. And only now, by looking at the real data, do you start to see that the data speaks for itself, regardless of your personal views, I think. Over the last few years, uh, we as a country are becoming more a more present witness to the unequal policing and its effects. Over-policing and surveillance of vulnerable, predominantly black and brown neighborhoods has resulted in the disproportionately large rate of imprisonment for black and brown men in America. Black men are incarcerated in state prisons across the country at more than five times the rate of white men. According to a 2020 proceeding from the National Academy of Science, police violence is a leading cause of death for young men in the United States. Over the life course, about one in every thousand black men can be expected to be killed by the police. And I feel like it's so critical to emphasize this framework for us as healthcare providers when we see our patients entering in these vulnerable spaces of healing and we are potentially contaminating and polluting that space with the presence of police. Yeah. And we're not lawyers. You know, they, we're not trained in the law. And so I think that there is, there is, we lose, we really have to do our, our own research and really dig in to figure out like, okay, where, where does privacy start and begin in the emergency department, you know, and then what can we do to help our patients out? The Supreme Court has over and over and over again ruled that, um, the emergency department is a public space, esteemed a public space. So any uh, Fourth Amendment protections to search and seizure are not present in the emergency department. And that has huge implications, huge implications. And if I can go quickly back to the exposure part to talk about that, when a patient is being exposed uh, for, for their medical treatment, if they have something in their pocket, for example, removing items, those things have to be itemized so they can be returned upon discharge. And sometimes you find things that uh, people kept in their pockets that they didn't want people to know that they had. And I know that I had an experience where uh, that happened and uh, someone uh, was itemizing some of the belongings and pulled out some black tar heroin. The curtains were open. They were waving around as sort of an evidence of this is the reason why they're probably here, um, which is great for us to know so we can treat them with some Narcan, but police were right outside the door. And luckily I had a, a fellow physician attending who quickly recognized that because they were very sensitive to, to, to that aspect and asked the, that person to put, put that object away. And so we enter, we enter into these spaces with no idea about what the, what the law says, and we're you know potentially criminalizing our patients and don't know that we're doing that. I want to emphasize what you said that we are in fact not lawyers, uh, nor did we take the bar exam before this podcast recording. Much of what we have said today comes from an incredible 2020 Harvard Law Review uh, written by G. Sion Song, uh, and it speaks heavily to many of the issues you presented. In fact jurisprudence and the interpretation by the courts of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, as you said, have essentially legalized the warrantless search, seizures, and interrogations in the ER. They've essentially granted police the power to use the ER as an extension of street policing without recognizing the vulnerability of the marginalized populations that rely on the emergency departments for their care. And as you said, the plain view doctrine as described in the Harvard Law Review, commonly arises in the emergency room with clothing discarded by hospital personnel during treatment or the evaluation for illicit substances that fall out of clothing or from patients while they're being treated. And if an item is deemed as within plain view, its incriminatory character is immediately apparent and the officer has a lawful right of access to the object. And this even extends to radiographic examinations. If a radiologist says that a certain identified object on a plain film or CT scan could potentially be an illicit drug that was ingested, that could serve as basis 
for uh, further investigation and a warrant for an arrest. And it, it strikes me as incredibly poignant that you've taken a sworn oath to preserve the dignity, preserve the humanity, and preserve the privacy of these patients in their most vulnerable moments. Yet you do not have the backing or the support of the greatest court in the country to secure that privacy. Yeah. And the, the other thing I wanted to sort of add uh, about, av- about advocating for your patients. So you say that you, you know that this is, this is a potential that we, we have potentially can be criminalizing our patients and you're hyper aware of those things. And so you, you're doing things to make sure that you give your patient privacy, but you are in the middle of your, uh, your primary survey, your secondary survey, in the middle of your workup, talking to the patient. And uh, sometimes you can have police can be in the department and uh, be interrupting care. That goes back to, you know, having that trust issue. When one person's doing something or, you know, trying to put an IV in or doing an assessment while the police officer is there asking questions and that can be distracting for everybody. And so on the other side of that, you have the risk and benefit that you're weighing of, you know, not pissing off the guy with the, with the gun in his hand and being arrested yourself. Now, some people don't, don't, not, you know, won't worry about that. And I, it's a, it's a good, it's nice to live in the privilege of having, not having that fear, but just knowing that that's a possibility for me is, is frightening. There have been doctors and nurses that have been threatened to be arrested for not doing blood draws or not doing cavity searches. Most recently, there was a nurse in Salt Lake City who was, she wasn't arrested, but she was detained with handcuffs because she refused to, to give blood, to draw blood and to give to an officer in the middle of the emergency department. So there's personal risk of possibly being, uh, being arrested. So you have to balance it. Your, your own sanity and safety versus uh, standing up for your patient. And that, that can be hard. That's not intuitive. Yeah, this does not mean to serve as legal advice, but according to the law review, doctors do have an independent basis for refusing court orders under special circumstances, and those statutes authorize them to comply with search warrants. Several states do not compel them to do so. So it's definitely worth discussing with risk management, perhaps having an annual or semi-annual reminder to healthcare providers working in particularly vulnerable situations of their rights and their abilities to advocate for their patients. Yeah, definitely, definitely. One thing you mentioned that seems to be a recurring theme within the language of oppression and the way we approach many of our disenfranchised patients is the criminalization of the patient. This Mm -hmm. mentality that the justification of a police presence within the ER is justified because they are there to preserve the safety of the healthcare providers and the institution. Are we wrong to think that having police in the ER is keeping us safer as healthcare providers? Yeah, that's a, that's a really tough question because, you know, there's an increased feeling of safety, no matter how you, how you, how you think of it. And that you have, um, you know, that there are people with uh, weapons that are, you know, on quote unquote, on your side, but, uh, then it, I would say like, it's hard to really study that, to really, to really know, um, if there is actually more, if people feel more safe actually in the emergency department, I, I don't know if, if patients do, you know, that's, that's a, that's a big, big question because, uh, you can certainly, you can certainly think that patients may or may not think that they feel more safe with someone who has a has a um, a weapon on them. I would imagine that a lot of providers probably do because they they don't feel threatened by their their presence. In fact, they do you know do as much as they can to protect uh, the healthcare workers. We know that uh, hospital shootings do happen. Kellen at all had a paper that listed out 154 shootings in 40 states. 2000 2011. There's a follow up by. Uh, wax at all this show between 2012 and 2016 there were 84 and i would be remiss to, to not to mention the recent shooting in the jacoby emergency department waiting room so there's an increase in the 
the danger uh, in, in the emergency department. And some people would say that, that the solution is having more people with guns there. I don't know the answer, Rochelle. <laughs> I don't know. Well, as you said, Jamal, there's very limited evidence. It seems like there's probably a systemic restriction on gun research in this country. But as you mentioned, public safety net hospitals have increased their use of police forces in the last two decades. Recent 2020 Scientific American Opinion piece highlighted that security officers carry handguns in 52% of hospital institutions, while 47% use tasers. And as you mentioned, according to that 2012 Annals of Emergency Medicine publication by Kellen et al., the ED accounted for almost a third of all gun shooting uh, reported events in their study, and 50% of the guns used in the ED were not brought by the perpetrator, but rather involves security personnel firearms. So perhaps a counterintuitive outcome where the presence of guns may be, in fact, the reason for the the violence in the ED setting. So at least something we're thinking about when we think the police presence is justifying our own safety. Yeah, that's a good point. I uh, was remiss in talking about that perspective of, you know, that's 154 that it actually comes from from the actual security personnel. And even thinking about even deeper, we, we're not really sure if that's necessary for it as well. And we'd be remiss as well not to emphasize the different vulnerable populations that come into the emergency department seeking services. The study also found that psychiatric patients were 16 times as likely to be victims of police brutality that one in every four of the thousand people killed by the U.S. every year is diagnosed with mental illness. So again, the concept of intersectionality, bringing these different marginalized groups together and compounding the effects of police presence. Jamal, you talked about the criminalization, again, of the healthcare providers towards the patients, uh, collaboration of our structure, our system, the hospital system with the legal system. Would you help share for our audience or at least educate uh, those who may not know about the 2001 Supreme Court decision of Ferguson versus the city of Charleston? So I'm not sure if that was the date. I believe it was a little earlier than that, but uh, I have to check my my notes on that. But basically, um, for a very long time, there were these uh, public hospitals that were predominantly serving these poor minority communities. And what they were doing was doing a, a drug screen uh, unknowingly on pregnant women and uh, using it as a way to uh, criminalize some black women in this community. Ultimately, that was shut down, shut down and found unconstitutional. But yet again, that, you know, this is a, an example that extension of law into medicine and the distrust that we, that a lot of black folks have, uh, of the medical system, because, you know, we're, we all talk about the government that was doing an experimental study on the men of Tuskegee. And then we all, we are somewhat, uh, familiar with, uh, Henrietta Lacks and the experiments that definitely took off and that were very were wonderful for the medical community, but ethical questions, you know, propped up after we learned that those, uh, those cells that are, were from her body and there was no consent. So we, again, we have to be sensitive to the fact that we as a medical system are as, as much as we, we say, oh, that's, that's, that's not my problem or I didn't do that, or that was in the past. You know, I think about these things as sort of, um, sort of a train, you know, this, our, our healthcare system has really started, we've been rooted back to almost to slavery and that we had this, these disparities, we had healthcare for slaved African-Americans and we have healthcare for, for all other people. And then, you know, that continued, if you think about it, through Jim Crow and not until, not until 1965 that we start to mandate with the Medicare and Medicaid Acts that we start to mandate that these uh, separate and unequal facilities start to integrate. And so, what was that, like 70, 
seven, almost 70 years ago. And there's some people are still alive. My grandmother is still alive and she was, you know, saw that transition. So she's got stories and she's the things that and she is weary about. And people come into the medical system with those, with that knowledge and it might not be those specific court decisions. It might be personal, personal experiences that they had themselves. And they're coming in with that burden and that perspective of the medical system of not, not to trust. And we've got to do something now that we're on this train, we have to do something to change that direction. And, you know, that's why I, I try to educate myself and, you know, help educate my colleagues about the history of medicine and in, in America and how we just, we need to be active to change the trajectory and not passive. And I think it echoes the, or underscores the importance of understanding the history that again, the Hill Burton Act of 1945 allowed for the separate but equal creation of medical facilities, despite the fact that we knew this to be unconstitutional from almost 50 years prior. And the ramifications of those essentially segregated by community hospitals, which I think now manifests as safety net hospitals, are put at increasing vulnerability, which puts the communities and the individuals in those communities at even higher risk for worse health outcomes. I think many of the conversations and talking points you bring up are incredibly summarized by a piece uh, by Dr. Jamila Parrott in the New England Journal from uh, 2020 entitled Hashtag White Coats for Black Lives, Addressing Physicians' Complicity in Criminalizing Communities. She talks about the unknown, uh, unconsented testing of uh, prenatal black and brown women that lead to mandatory reporting for polices, especially as a result of the 1990s crack cocaine epidemic. And that this testing, often undisclosed and performed without patient consent, resulted in parents losing their children and being incarcerated. She highlights the fact that black families are more likely to be reported and investigated for child abuse and neglect, to have their cases substantiated, and to have their children removed from their custody or care. And once in foster care, black children remain in custody longer than white children and generally receive inferior services. Clearly, the decisions and potential unintentional or intentional collaborations with law enforcement can have ramifications that extend beyond even the patient and affect the patient's offspring and their entire uh, family and generations to come. Michelle, you have, like I said, you've you know, really gone into the, done your homework, done the research. And, you know, there's, there's still people that will say, you know, I personally uh, don't have any biases. So how can the structure in which I'm working on, how can that be biased? And I think that when people say that, it really discredits all the, the scientific work, the, the work that people do to look back historically and gather that information for us and, and highlight it for us to let us know that it does exist and it has existed. And uh, we are just sort of the tip of the iceberg and seeing how these large structural uh, disparities and health, how they're affecting people every single day. And, you know, on the opposite side of that, I really try to go out and read opposite opinions because I think that that's important too. But I find I'm hard pressed to find a PhD dissertation or well-researched scholarly work that discusses the opposite side that says that there's no longer any systemic racism in America. And the things that I read are mostly opinion articles and mostly talk about how divisive it is to talk about these things. And I don't, you know, I, I know it's probably hard to hear and they're very tough conversations, conversations to have, but well, we need to have them because if, like I said before, we're on a train and if we're passive about the way that the train is moving, then we're going to end up in the same place that we were or are right now, but there's still so much work to be done. Well, I think as Dr. Kamar P. Jones likes to remind us, uh, this, the effects of oppression and systemic racism affect all of us and not just certain communities. And as physicians and healthcare providers, we really do wield the power, the privilege and responsibility for dismantling these different elements for our patients. And I think 
with more education, with more commitment to making diversity, equity, inclusion part of your professional med- medical competency, ongoing, continuing medical education, we can start to unravel many of these historical truths that we have become very good at denying or ignoring. Start to hopefully, if as, as we said before, if we name it, we can finally start to treat it. Jamal, uh, many of our listeners uh, are aspiring physicians, either college students, medical students, thinking about applying into to residency. As we bring our conversation to a close, is there any last piece of advice or guidance you'd like to impart on them? Sure. I mean, um, I love what I do. I'm sure that you would say the same thing, uh, Vishal. My job is completely different than yours, but at the end of the day, I think we're blessed and highly favored because we have these purpose-driven lives. We found things that we can wake up every day and, and do um, and feel like we've made a meaning, meaningful connection with another person. And in some ways, we've, we're hoping to make a world a better place. And throughout all those things, we there was a lot of trial and tribulation, a lot of a lot of late nights, uh, a lot of a lot of disappointing scores for me at least. <laughs> But uh, disappointing days, but uh, at you know at the end of the day, you you, know, you have a long a long term goal. Keep your head down. Uh, reach out to mentors that are a couple steps ahead of you, and uh, talk talk to them about their experience, and try to get a try to understand what it takes to to get to where they're at. And I would say you know I emulate them, and and that's what I that's what I do. That's what I've done in the past, and. And I've been successful at it, and that's been my strategy. Well, I thank you, Jamal. I hear resilience. I hear mentorship, sponsorship, perseverance. I also want to end the conversation on a reflection of joy, that there is still joy in medicine. There is great joy in taking care of patients day in and day out, uh, even in the middle of a global pandemic as we uh, pass our second year. Jamal, on behalf of the Back Table Podcast Group, I thank you for your time and energy and willingness to engage in what is a challenging conversation and topic, to say the least. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this week's episode and discussion of the Back Table Podcast, and we look forward to engaging in more discussions in the future. Thank you all and be well. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.